Hey, this Christmas party's getting a little too quiet. I think it's time we liven it up with my favorite Christmas gift, Mr. Microphone. Hey, what's that? Well, you set the dial on your FM radio and... Testing, testing, testing. Ah! Oh, the radio! These kids are having a fabulous time with Mr. Microphone, the cordless microphone that actually puts your voice on the radio. There are no attaching wires, so you're free to move around. Broadcast over any FM car radio. Hey, good looking. We'll be back to pick you up later. You can broadcast in mono or with more radios in stereo. Yeah. Professional entertainers use... Life is a reward given to us the moment someone went balls deep into our mother and planted the seed that made us be. But there are very few of us that can appreciate how fleeting the gift of this life can be. Case in point. When John van der Heiden was going out early Saturday to do some chores, he spotted his daughter's car parked beside the local cemetery. Finding it odd, he turned around, went to that car, and inside it was her purse and her keys. When he called his wife, she said that she thought that Cindy would be at work. When they called her work, she had never arrived. And that was the last time the Vanderheidens would see their daughter alive. Where Shermantine and Lauren Herzog, well, they were just a couple of good old boys. Childhood friends, and they were known at school to like a puff or two, or three. Wes was known as a bully. Both of them liked to chase tail. And when they left school, well, I guess not much changed. And I guess there weren't a lot to do in the town of Linden, except for look for trouble. By all accounts, the undynamic duo regularly found it. Bar fights, drugs, harassing anything in a skirt. To say that they were well known to the authorities, well, that was an understatement. 16 year old Chevelle Wheeler, known as Chevy to her friends, was a real wild child. Guys who knew her said she was like riding a Bronco. The only difference was, that a Bronco didn't make you prematurely ejaculate in your pants. Making sure her daughter got to school, Chevy's mother dropped her off there herself. A pile of counts, Chevy walked in the front door and went straight out the back. She bragged to friends that she was going up to Wes Sherpentine's family's hunting cabin to get baked. And when she said baked, I'm guessing she didn't mean a threesome with Betty Crocker. When Chevy went home that next morning, her father, went and paid a visit to 19-year-old Wes's house. But Wes just laughed it off and said he hadn't seen Chevy. And the father had to take his word for it and left. But he didn't believe him, so he called the cops. And when they questioned him, the cops didn't believe him either. And they went up and started poking around the family's hunting lodge. Hillbilly cops, armed with a search warrant, they went through the cabin, plank by plank. And it was clear to the cops that something had gone on in the cabin, because the first thing they found were blonde pussy hairs. Then they found specks of blood everywhere, including on the mattress. And it was then that Wes changed his story, and he said that Chevy had been up there, and they'd done a little fucking and some hunting, catching some squirrels and killing them, and that's where the blood came from. And being this with the infancy and DNA testing, cops had no proof otherwise, and they had to cut Wes loose and put Chevy down as another missing person. The Shermantine family were prominent in the community, but for all the wrong reasons. They were known as bullies, and if you crossed them, they held grudges, and they'd take care of business. The Shermantines and the Herzogs were neighbors, so Wes and Lorn had been friends since they were in diapers. But Lorne was the passive one, and he took his orders from Wes. The family had a successful property leasing company 
as well as selling livestock. But they had a reputation for being ruthless. Once when an invoice went unpaid, the mother went to the house of a client and got into a bulldozer and flattened the house, almost killing the family inside. Even the cops were afraid of them, but the abuse didn't stop at just the outsiders. Both parents were regularly abusive to their children. Incest, animal cruelty. The dad's idea of punishing his son was taking out a gun and shooting at his feet and making him dance. By the mid 80s, both Lauren and Wes's idea of recreation was getting high on methamphetamines, drive around that car, going hunting, shooting, looking for action, whatever came that way. And by both of their accounts, when they were looking for action, they eventually found it. Now the duo were regularly doing crank, sometimes staying up three or four nights straight. And when they weren't driving around hunting, they'd hang out in bars. And they'd worked out a technique to meet the ladies. Herzog, the better looking and the charmer of the two, would meet the girls and bring them over to the table. Then Shermantine would pull out the drugs, ask girls if they wanted the party, and then take them off to a remote location. Those girls have never been identified or never found. Cindy Vanderheiden had gone to a bar on Friday the 13th and she disappeared into thin air. She told a friend that she'd gone on a date with a guy that she knew from school. By all accounts, she'd been standing at a bar with her date when he went to the bathroom, a man matching Herzog's description, approached her and told her to ditch the boyfriend and they'd go party together. And I guess she wanted to party because she was seen leaving the bar with two men believing to be Herzog and Schumantine. And she was never seen again. Witnesses say when the date came out of the toilet, he had a shocked look on his face and a piss stain on his pants. And you want to go party. So, uh, she can't talk to me and Wes. But that was the last time the young woman would ever party because Herzog got into a car with her and then went to the local cemetery. Sherman Tyne would follow behind and then she got into his vehicle with the two men. And the drugs went for free. And it's kind of a back and forth argument kind of thing. And I mean, the dude stuff is in, uh, Sexual act, I guess that's what you call it. As the woman lay on her stomach and he started fucking her from behind, he cut her throat. She, she was tough. Tough than I am, I think. But, you know, she was trying to fuck her. I don't know, I guess he, he must have been having a hard time. I mean, he was, you know, <clears throat> like, on top of her, like, kind of holding her down, you know? And I guess Mr. Georgian, I can Now investigators had witnesses who saw Wes Sherman Tyne with two of the missing girls. And although he refused to meet officers at the police station, he agreed to be questioned in a donut shop. And for identification purposes, we'll identify by voice. Just say your name. Wesley Howard Sherman. But he still denied ever knowing Cindy Van Der Heiden. She Cindy never spoke to me. She never spoke to you. Never spoke so to the me. people that say that she was talking to you and Lauren are lying. Well, no, they got me confused because I don't know Cindy. And with no physical evidence, 
much less a body. The investigators were helpless and had to cut him loose. And with the surrounding area of Calaveras County made up of hundreds of abandoned wells and mine shafts, finding a body would be like looking for a brown M&M and a pair of retard shitty underwears. $20,000 was pledged to find Sidney Vanderheiden. Sidney, if you're out there and you're afraid to come home, don't be because I won't get mad. Just come home. Now investigators knew that the best chance was to divide Herzog and Shermantine, with Shermantine clearly being the one who was calling the shots. You don't even have to tell us what if you just want to say yes or no. I don't? No. Okay. He does have something over you. I've got to... No, you don't. He said it. <laughs> if we take West to jail and charge him with murder, will that change anything for you? And be honest with me. If it won't, then just say no. But yes or no, if, if we are successful in taking him to jail and charging him with murder, Will that change anything for you as far as Wes's power over you? Or will it go with him wherever he goes? Will he always have the power to reach out and no. keep you silent? I think that was these things. Well, give, it, away. give it some thought, okay? Yeah, really and although investigators were having a tough time Breaking Herzog, little did they know that that big break was just around the corner. Because unemployed construction worker Wes Shermantine, now married with three kids, was having problems making payments on his car, and it was repossessed by the dealership. And although investigators couldn't get a search warrant for Shermantine's house or any of his vehicles, they certainly could pick up a bargain at the used car dealership. And when they ran DNA checks on the car that they knew where Shermantine was driving on the night that Sidney went missing, bingo, her DNA was spread all over it, like shit stains on a paraplegic's couch. And Wes was starting to get antsy. You have something on me, you. arrest me. Otherwise, get off my family's case, get off my back. Now, I'm tired of cooperating. I've been cooperating all along. Just getting be bullshit. Every the other week, the only call. thing, the only other thing I've asked you if to do. If you have something, arrest me. The only other thing I ask. Otherwise, I'm gonna have my lawyer press charges for harassment. But investigators did have something else up their sleeve, with DNA technology now being advanced enough. They were able to start opening up their cold cases, and that meant running tests on the specks of blood that they'd found up at the Sherman Tines hunting lodge. And the blood specks, as well as the blonde pubic hairs, belonged to Chevy Wheeler. But now Sherman Tyne had some explaining to do. But unbeknownst to him, his best friend had started panicking and was now dropping shit bombs. The first of those shit bombs was that he and his amigo had been responsible for the 1984 homicide of two homos popped up in a car with both of them having their faces shot off. He even identified Wes's car that had been seen driving away from the crime. And far from trying to coerce a statement out of him, they couldn't shut him up. Now Lon Herzog was singing like a retard with a Mr. Microphone on Christmas morning. He even drawing pretty pictures showing investigators where they could find some of the bodies. And he figured there were over a hundred of them. In fact, he'd lost count. And he told him it was all Sherman time leading the way, and that he was terrified of his best friend. He couldn't stop him. He were a natural bone killer. Story after story, and it almost seemed unbelievable if it weren't so real. With their victims including missing children, they even shot a traveling salesman who'd fallen asleep in his car just to watch him die. Speed freaks hunting humans. Then what happens? But his memories were random, and he couldn't remember where any of the bodies were, including the girls. I'm just telling you, oh, really? I'm trying to be honest with you. You want me to sign my name in blood? I mean, you just I don't need know to understand. Where she was. I mean, I okay. tell you, Lauren, cool. you I need to understand what I'm, what, what I'm thinking I mean, and what I'm worried about. I don't know how bad I wish I knew where she was. Okay. Because 
then I could say, there it is. And while Herzog was telling the investigators the whole story, Sherman Tyne was still plain stupid. So we have this situation 13 years ago. I mean, you're only 33 years old, Wes. 32. 32. And twice in your life, you're being questioned with regards to a missing female. I realize, you know, that's, I mean, what do you think about that? That's terrible. Two times, you're only 32. And flatly deny having any contact with Cindy Vanderheim, either in conversation with her at the bar, you didn't talk to her.